This lecture is dedicated to Mause Oliver Bakavomawo, another junior brother of mine, for all his work in trying to hashtag fix the country and to reform our constitution. It is also dedicated to my big brother Akuto Ampao and Justice Srem Sai, another junior brother of mine, and all the other lawyers and activists who are working around the clock to secure his release from unlawful detention. I visited Mausi in jail some two weeks ago, and the conditions under which he was being held are not fit even for your worst enemy. But for this lecture, I would have joined the legal team in court today. It is no coincidence that his first court visit was on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. And his next court visit today is the anniversary of the 28th February 1948 shooting. We live in a spiritual world. Like the psalmist says, the fool says unto himself, there is no God. Sometimes God speaks to us by timing events, ruling the cosmos and the elements, and our actions to coincide with particular times and seasons in order to give us a message. Those who have spiritual ears, let them hear. Amen. Let me end this part of my speech here before I am arrested or before they send the tax authorities to come and find fault with my law firm by force. <laughs> Introduction. When I am introduced as the Dean of the University of Ghana School of Law, it makes it extremely difficult for me to speak the naked truth. As you all know, we all live a lie. No one speaks the truth. We all say what we are permitted to say, or what we deem fit to say, at each point in time, and depending on our circumstances. So right now, what constrains me are my membership of the General Legal Council and my deanship of the University of Ghana School of Law. And so I would like to respectfully demand of you to imagine what I would have said <laughs> if these two constraints were not upon my shoulders. I love my Vice Chancellor very much. And the last thing I would like is for her to call me in the early morning and ask, Kut, Dean, what have you gone to say? Unquote. Where still, I am dreading the words of my dear wife when I get home today and she says, Kut, Akumbi, what have you gone to say again? Akumbi, a shortened version of my local, authentic spiritual name, is what she calls me when I am in trouble. I'm sure the men here can relate. My uncle Sam Jonah said recently, Kut, it appears to me that in recent times, our fourth Republican dispensation, the courage to stand up for the truth and the determination to uphold the common good is lost. In our dark moments as a nation, it is concerning that the voices of the intellectuals are receding into oblivion. Sadly, it is a consequence of the deep partisan polarization of our country, such that everything is seen through the lenses of politics. It appears to me that the culture of silence has returned, this time not enforced by legal and military power, but true convenience, parochialism, hypocrisy, and a lack of conviction. Where are the Adubwahins? and PV answers, unquote. So Uncle Samjona received the below as a feeble attempt at partial redemption of academia. We wait for the clergy, the CSOs, the media, labor unions, and others who were so vociferous in condemning the past regime to redeem themselves down memory lane. I was conceived in a village called Nalerugu, near Gambaga, some 35 miles from Vice President Mahmoud Baumia's hometown. At that time, we still retained in Ghana the traditional home science and knowledge with which to determine exactly when a prospective mother 
would bear the child. The science of traditional birth attending was fast being eroded. So a few days to the birth, my mother traveled to Bogatanga, where her brother was a nurse, in order to receive higher than average medical attention during the birth. Soon after my birth, we returned to Nalerugu. <clears throat> Soon after my birth, we returned to Nalerugu, where I lived the very first several years of my childhood. I was born on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. So forgive me when I say some foolish things during this lecture. <laughs> it's the April Fool's thing working. Somehow, I carry very distinct memories of my complicated childhood. One of such memories is the regular visitations of the military Mowaks and trucks in the immediate aftermath of the 1979 coup. In the village, there were mechanisms of communication that appeared more effective than the mobile phone in speed and reach. And so, we will hear about the soldiers and that they were on their way well before they got to our home. My mother sold everything. One of the distinct memories I have is when she was arrested for selling pencils, I believe, above control price. By that time, my father had been transferred from Nalirugu to Boku, and then to Damangu, Dr. Abu Sakara knows very well, the village where President John Dramani Mahama was born. Back to Nalirugu, near Vice President Baumea's hometown, we always had a pretty dark, deep trench at the back of the house. And when word reached us that the soldiers were on their way, we would drape large sheets of plastic or cloth over the trench, fill it up with all my mother's wares, cover them up with the ends of the plastic or the cloth that stretched over the top of the trench, and cover the trench with earth, and then with anything that would obscure it. When there was time, we would then sweep the whole compound, including over the trench, so that it all looked evenly swept and undetectable and so that the many footprints of the hiders of the wares will be erased, leaving only the even footprints of the sweepers across the entire patched earth of the compound. Many times, my mother would meet the soldiers across the compound before they walked up to our home, or sometimes before they got out of their vehicles. Often, she would succeed in turning them away with a combination of native, native wisdom, wit, and humor. Sometimes it helped that she was the wife of the first headmaster of the new secondary school in the village. Sometimes it attracted undue attention, suspicion, targeting, hatred, and reprisals. In those days, anyone with puss was guilty until proven innocent. And the names of the offenses were hilarious economic sabotage, engaging in acts calculated to cause disaffection for the revolution, government indiscipline. A few years later, when we lived in Boko, and after the 1981 coup, our family was targeted in this way. I still recall the morning our home was attacked and ransacked. Everything was carried away. We moved to stay with a distant relative farther from town. My father was put before a public tribunal and charged with offenses whose names I am unable to recall now. Throughout the period of his trial, he was without a job, without a salary, and in constant fear of his life and the lives of members of his family. When we relocated at night on various occasions, he carried a sharpened cutlass with him. The entire family had to live on the back of my heavily pregnant mother and subsequently nursing mother throughout this period. I have recounted before how my father was made to account for his stu stewardship of the school he headed, how he accounted for all of it but for one shovel, one pickaxe, and four pesos, how the shovel and pickaxe were later retrieved at the building site, and how he refused to plead guilty to misappropriating four pesos and how the receipts of the four pesos were later found. After he was found not guilty, he was restored to his post, paid his emoluments, 
and promoted. Others were not that lucky. Many Ghanaians who were not able to beat the system the way my mother did, or successfully fight the system the way my father did, were mistreated, beaten, even killed. We do not want a coup in this country. Yet I fear that if we do not act quickly, we may have won in our hands very soon. A former colleague doctoral student at Harvard wrote his dissertation also on Ghana. He now teaches at a war college in the US. Imagine the name of the college, War College. Whilst my topic was on the Ghana police, his topic was on the Ghana military. Naturally, our paths intersected and we have remained friends since. My friend's PhD thesis was on the topic, quote, why certain coups succeed and why others fail. His case study was Ghana. My current assessment that Ghana may be ripe for a coup partly springs from the knowledge I gained from accompanying my friend through part of his doctoral research on this topic. It does not help matters if we consider Samuel Huntington's thesis on the snowballing effect of coups in the subregion and the closeness of recent coups to whom. I urge my good friend, the Minister of National Security, Honorable Kandapa, to have a conversation with my friend at the War College. The economy of Ghana today. A big part of why certain coups succeed and others fail is the economy. What is the state of Ghana's economy today? At the level of the most irreducible idiomaticity, Ghana is broke. Your nation is radically broke. So broke, the Speaker of Parliament has publicly warned, gavel in hand, that we may not be able to pay the salaries of public sector workers in some three months unless a miracle happens. The Minister for, National, for Finance has weighed in. In very fine and polished English, he says something like, quote, the legitimate reality is that there is no money, unquote. At least, he has confessed to us that there are some illegitimate realities. <laughs> Here, we recall the African adage, quote, if a crocodile comes out of the water and tells you that a fish is dead, do you challenge, unquote. The Minister for Finance and other government officials add that soon Ghana will not be able to fund the free SHS the SHS scheme, pay the District Assembly's Common Fund, pay the National Health Insurance Levy, pay the Ghana Education Trust Fund, pay the salaries of government workers, pay lecturers in public universities, and end the debilitating strike action by them, pay the areas owed various contractors, build roads and other infrastructure, and create jobs for the youth. The finance minister finally says that government may have to generate monies from fuel price hikes, which are already taking place, and leading to increases in transport fares. Costs are rising in Ghana. Housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels are 28.7%, as well as transport at 17.4% pushing the rate of inflation for January 2022 to 13.4%, according to the Ghana Statistical Service. The Ghana Statistical Service also revealed that food inflation recorded a rate of 13.7%, having risen from 12.8% in the previous month and for an average of 104 in the previous several months before that, so it's climbing. Non-food inflation also went up in January 2022 to 14.1% compared with the 12.5% recorded in December 2021. So it's also climbing. In the words of President Mahama, 
time is ticking for the crisis-ridden Ghanaian economy. There is no dispute that the Ghanaian economy is in deep crisis, a crisis marked by huge budget deficits and unsustainable public debt, rising inflation, a rapidly depreciating CD, ever-rising cost of living, and a loss of confidence by both domestic and international investor communities. The effects of these have been severe hardships and suffering for the people of Ghana, especially those within vulnerable groups. As a result of the horrendous low point we have now reached, it's very clear that urgent intervention is required to avert a total collapse of the economy." Unquote. Ghana's city has performed abysmally since the beginning of 2022, despite the efforts of the Bank of Ghana to artificially hold it down. The Ghana city ranked second worst among 15 top performance currencies in Africa recently. In the last few months, the city has depreciated heavily against the major currencies, moving from five point something cities to seven point something cities against the dollar in just a few months. When President Mahama handed over power, the city was four point something to the dollar. Today, it is seven point something in the Forex Bureau. This morning, Joy Business, drawing from international business news, reported that the Ghana city is now the worst performing African currency, having depreciated by 7.6% in January and February 2022 alone. And I hope we all now know that if the fundamentals of the economy are weak, the exchange rate will expose you. Let us remember that the financial crisis is a byproduct of crisis in the real sector of the economy. Dr. Abu Sakara will tell you that. For example, cocoa production in Ghana dropped significantly last year, according to the figures of the International Cocoa Organization. Whilst Ivory Coast recorded a drop of just 4%, for some reason, Ghana recorded a staggering drop of 54%. What is happening? The International Cocoa Organization is still surprised and perplexed that purchasing of graded and sealed cocoa beans for the 2021-2022 cocoa year, as at 6 January 2022, were reported at 263,000 tons only, and please compare the 263,000 tons for, with 570,000 tons a year earlier. Our president himself has weighed in on the economy and is reported to be, quote, upset and anxious about CD depreciation. Quote, I am aware of the anxiety there is in business circles and throughout the population about the recent depreciation of the city. I am extremely upset and anxious about it too." Unquote. What our president and our government officials are saying about our economy is consistent with what the international financial community has said. Late last month, Bloomberg, Reuters, and Fitch all agreed that Ghana's debt has moved into deeper distress at over 80% of G GDP. The Ghana Statistical Service, I keep to the Ghana Statistical Service because it is the official authority. The Ghana Statistical Service puts it at almost 85% debt to GDP ratio, rising from 31.4% just a decade ago when President Mills was president. And to compare, as at the time President Mahama left office, it was 55.94%. The rating agencies are that Ghana is at risk of a debt crunch with interest payments alone absorbing about half of total government revenues. And this is the second highest, uh, this is the second highest ratio 
in the entire world of 200 countries. So we are number 199 over 200. Resultantly, Ghana was downgraded to B minus with a negative outlook and then to C. First time ever. The Bloomberg has added Ghana to the five fragile indebted African nations who are at risk and on a precipice. The five worst African countries, Ghana, Nkrumah's Ghana, is among them. So we can no longer borrow on the international financial markets except at horrendous interest rates. And our only hope, some say, is to go back to the IMF. After pretending to recant a little later, Fitch concludes, quote, general government debt reached an estimated 83% of GDP at end 2021. Who remembers the figure given by Ghana Statistical Service? 85. Including approximately 2% of GDP in debt held through the energy sector levy special purpose vehicle. 83 plus 2 is what? So the statistical service is right. We forecast government debt to remain on an upward path through 2025. <laughs> I'm depressed to read the rest of it. Maybe I should skip a bit. Debt affordability metrics will remain weak. Ghana's debt constitutes 539 percent of government revenue, compared to other B medians of 325 percent. You are doing almost double. Let me skip that depressing part. What amazes me is that when things were not one tenth as bad under the Mahama regime. Occupy Ghana marched on the office of the president, the then Flagstaff House, now called Jubilee House, on 1st July 2014. Many leaders, clergy, intellectuals, lawyers, journalists, many Ghanaians urged them on as they raided the premises of the office of the president insulted the president to high heavens by the minute, by the hour, by the day, emboldened by a correct interpretation of the law to the effect that it is not a crime to insult the president. President Mahama asked that the security forces not react negatively and that no one should be hurt. I am talking from personal experience because I was inside Flax House that day. Marching on the office of the president, a national security zone, is not a crime. Saying that you will do the coup using the definite article, a reference to the coup that the market women in Kumasi already say they will do, is a heinous crime. Some months after the march on Flagstaff House in 2014, I told the president that I was returning to Legon to continue my job as a people teacher. I explained in part that I was no longer able to align my lifelong activism with the state of things then. By 2019, I had sought out President Mahama and told him that he was a far better president. In 2016, the price of a liter of petrol was 3.75 Ghana cities. Today, it has broken the eight and is selling at almost eight cities a liter. I used to fill my tank with 400 Ghana cities in 2016. Today, I fill it with 1,000 Ghana cities when it is empty. When I was appointed dean, one of my junior brothers came to my house, took my RAV4 away, and left his Land Cruiser and said, the RAV4 doesn't befit your position. So now I'm saddled with a Land Cruiser, which I have to fill every week. A thousand Ghana. A bowl of kinky was 70 pesos in 2016. 
Today, it is two cities at my last visit, and it seems to have shrunk in size. <laughs> Trot fare from Circle to Adenta was three cities, 70 pesos in 2016. Today, it is seven cities. And yet, income levels have remained virtually the same with only the usual nominal increases in government wages over the period. And so, Mr. Kwame Pianin, a renowned New Patriotic Party politician and economist, is reported to have said that it is a shame Ghana's yield trained finance minister has been a historic disaster. Today, things are 10 times worse, and all we hear is loud silence. As Adangba has said in his song, Animal Farm, the country where I come from, the truth is an irony. Just like Animal Farm, justice means inequity. So who go say the truth? Christian council, silence. Islamic leaders, silence. Kings and queens, silence. Traditional rulers, silence. Who go say the truth? TUC, silence. Even journalists, silence. And Yansafor, more here. Then he tells the story of Nana Yankamasem, who kills and imprisons anyone who speaks against him. Quote, everybody is afraid. Nana Oseyemai. All this is from the songu, not from me. <laughs> but everybody is afraid. Right is right, wrong is wrong. No matter how you justify. You say you want get to get rid of corruption. Someone want to help you. Now the person becomes a target. Unquote. End of the song. It is sad that we have had to get here. For me, what is sadder is what the running down of our enviable economy has done to families and to people's lives. Recently, a band of armed robbers robbed some Kumasi-bound travelers in a VIP bus from Takradi while saying to them, quote, pray for us. The system has made us so. In the words of a passenger in the bus, quote, after the robbery, they asked us to pray for them because it was not their will to stop vehicles on the highway and rob passengers of their belongings, but the system has compelled them to do so. They did not hurt any of the passengers. They just took their monies and properties and left. After a friend of ours was robbed at gunpoint recently, Witness the following WhatsApp chat that we engaged in on our platform. This is getting serious, commentator one. Commentator two, the national service lady in our office just told me she was also robbed at gunpoint last week. Commentator three, a friend was robbed around Trasaco Estate at gunpoint yesterday at 9 a.m. Just one WhatsApp chat of a few people has pointed to personal experiences of several gunpoint robberies. Hmm, that's another person. The next person says, whoa, country hot to, four more to do more. <laughs> another one says, if you mind your business, you get robbed, I'm leaving this country. Another one says, if you complain, you get arrested. Another one says, no one is safe. Another one says, hmm, things are getting out of hand. Later on, I'll pass the chat to you for those interested. We must remember that our current president has always been worried about scenarios such as I have painted above. Speaking at the Ebenezer Hall Presbyterian Church, Usu Accra, on 29 May 2009, he said, quote, I am very concerned that sooner or later, militants on our side, convinced that the state cannot or will not protect them, may take measures to protect their interests. 
themselves and their loved ones. Events then will be out of control, driving all of us towards a point of no return." Unquote. Where are we now, and how did we get there? We all know that the episodic spectacularization of our economy by governments are strong, contrasts starkly with the reality. Reckless election expenditure in 2020 undermined the economy greatly, as government had to rev up sp spending to match the opposition party that met it boot for boot in the elections and claimed so many parliamentary seats from it. Of all the monies that we have borrowed from the bond markets in the last decade, 71% of it was borrowed by the current government. Over their entire four-year tenure, the Mahama regime borrowed less than three billion from the bond markets. Less than three billion in four years. In fact, it counts from 2012, so it's more than four years. In 2021 alone, one single year, the current government borrowed more than three billion dollars in one year. In 2018, they borrowed two billion. In 2019, three billion. In 2020, another three billion. And in 2021, they actually added up to the three billion. So it's in excess of three billion. And this is from the bond market alone. We have encountered the mopping up of domestic savings. Aside borrowing huge amounts of money, not for production, but mostly for consumption, the government consistently moved the country steadily away from growth-inducing investments and into consumption. I'll give you some examples. Many new ministries that would not qualify for administrative units in a viable country were created. A bloated cabinet, the largest we have ever had since independence. Free SHS, creation of six new regions. Six new regions. The last time we created a region before that was in 1983. Creation of 44 new districts bringing the number to 261 in one tiny unitary microstate, which is not a federation. Adding 300,000 jobs, more than that, for party faithful to the public wage bill. This is what has gotten us to this crisis. You cannot consume when you have not created. That is the problem. Future outlook, Ghana now and in the next few years. I'm getting to the end. I had a party in my home some years ago. As usual, somebody came with a gallon of apetesh. Real local content. Now the red and white labels and cognacs were merely for display on the table. The Akweteshi, in a white gallon, was placed under the table. I do not know why we do that. And the Akweteshi got exhausted quickly. <laughs> not the exotic drinks. They go quarter way down. I return to the cabinet and I wait another party. The way we treat the Akweteshi is the way we treat the real state of our economy. We hide it. In real African tradition, we believe that a good economy, and certainly money, doesn't like noise. So forgive me when I say publicly that Ghana is done broke. There is no other way to say it. We are not suffering passing illiquidity. We are not experiencing temporary financial distress. 
we have accumulated debt stock that is crippling the economy. Unless we allow the reality of this current situation of our economy to sink in, so that we can with cool heads, calm hearts, and steady fingers, pull ourselves, in the words of Kwesibochi, back from the precipice. We are economically doomed. And as you know, it is the economy, stupid. The sad news is this. We are not just broke. Unless we do something about it immediately, we are going to be economical, we are going to be in economic and financial ruins. Is it ruins or ruins? Ruins for the next 12 years. In the next three years, we all know that the government is capable of doing only one thing, borrow more domestically and internationally. In order to pay the public wage bill, barely keep up with interest payments on loans, the principal will remain intact, depend on donor funds for most goods and services, and borrow even more to start some infrastructure projects just for sure. So three years gone. Domestic borrowing will starve the economy of needed capital to grow, completely suffocating it. Increasing cost of living will fuel labor unrest, and government will further empty all local coffers, mopping up any available excess liquidity, and borrowing more internationally to pay up. Then, having laden us with even more crippling debt, and securing an economy on life support. And amidst fanfare, they will gladly hand over to a new administration on 7th January 2025. The processes for doing the above will not be smooth sailing, especially with a hung parliament, unless some minority MPs are locked up in jail or forcefully kicked off their seats through civil suits in accordance with the plan for these that are now underway. There will be stiff opposition to government's quest for approvals for loans and critical initiatives by the minority caucus in parliament. But this will not be a good thing because it will lead to increased transaction costs for those loans, higher kickbacks, and poorer deals, all of which are ultimately debt for we, the people, to carry on our backs. So, Mr. Sosu, when you're opposing these loans, remember that we are just increasing the 10% to 20% for the initiator of the loan because it's more difficult for him to get it. And so his cut will be higher. And the deal will be worse because they have to negotiate down. And then we are all in deeper debt. The next administration, I pity the next president and administration would immediately be faced with the following. One, a huge election bill to service, as the coming elections will be expensive, given the third forces that are emerging. So they have to buy them in or do deals with them. Two, huge interest and principal payments for the previous eight years. Some of them due in 2025, weeks after the new president assumes office. And some in 2026, not just interest, but what? Principal. Three, angry and hungry supporters who have been kicked out of the public service and financially emasculated for eight years at rates and to extents never experienced in the last 30 years, and who have laid down their lives, limbs, and empty packets for the win at the elections. And the last thing the new administration will be faced with is an economy on its deathbed. If we allow the above scenario to unfold, the next administration will have no choice but to run to the IMF. And we all know that the IMF does one thing, and one thing only. It does not take a do not resuscitate order. 
And so, Professor Ajimambedu, of course, would understand what I'm saying. And so, with the two electric shock parts in hand, the IMF will shock our economy back to life. We will, however, remain on the sick bed and in the sick bay as long as the IMF is with us. Once they get in, they will not leave until after four years of that administration are over. So three years of more borrowing and crippling the economy, four years of IMF, how many years? It is only in the next three to four years that the same or another administration will now begin to draw us back completely from the precipice. That will be 11 to 12 long years lost to the Ghanaian economy. Most of us sitting here, young, virile, would have retired by then. We cannot allow this to happen to this nation. Finally, what should we do and what should we not do? I have stated all the problems. I'm now trying to proffer some solutions as the last segment of the speech. There is only one thing to do now. Prevent a coup in Ghana. Since the climate and the environment, national and immediate international, are conducive for one. Preventing a coup in Ghana today is not very difficult. In fact, it is pretty easy. If we put politics and male egos aside, it is an easy three-step process. However, before we get to what we must do and the three-step process, let me consider what we must not do. First, we must compel the government to acknowledge the current economic mess, they mostly, and previous governments to a lesser extent, have driven us into. Denialism should not be allowed. I am glad that the government and the Minister of Finance, my friend Ken Oforiata, has acknowledged our dire economic situation. So the first thing not to do is denialism. Second, we must not accept the lie that the current economic crisis is due to COVID. The injection of cash into the economy from various financial institutions during COVID and the forced import substitution economy could have actually improved our economy if it were better managed. And especially as we took a comparatively light hit from COVID. Ghana's economic problems started before COVID-19. On balance, COVID-19 was a good thing for Africa and Ghana. Not many people died. And yet huge opportunities opened up in import substitution and reduction of the import bill. And even in the digital economy, from whence E-Levy, ironically, cometh. The current administration in 2020-2021 received very large bailouts. $1 billion, not CDs, concessionary facility from IMF. Another $1 billion in special drawing rights allocation. Almost half billion from the World Bank. Additionally, Ghana took a quarter billion from our stabilization fund and 10 million CDs from the Bank of Ghana totaling 30 billion Ghana cities. We didn't get as much money <laughs> before COVID. So financially, COVID was a good thing for government. The conclusion of the joint World Bank IMF debt sustainability analysis on Ghana in December 2019, months before COVID hit Ghana, had this to say, quote, before COVID, they told us, quote, Ghana is at high risk of external debt distress, with threshold breached on the present value of external debt to GDP ratio, the debt service to export ratios, and the external debt service to revenue ratios, with the latter exceeding the threshold throughout the forecast horizon. So 
we should not accept the lie that our current economic situation was created by COVID. It is not true. Third, we must compel the current government to fix its own economic mess. Carry your own shit, excuse my French. We will not be your night soil carriers in the future. At the end of June 2020, Ghana's death stock was approximately 258.4 billion Ghana cities, an increase of 118% in just four years. Abba. Fourth, we must ensure that the government does not run to the IMF for a bailout. Like Minister for Finance Ken Oforiata has said, quote, whatever we do, we are not going to the IMF. The consequences are dire. We are a proud nation. We have the resources. We have the capacity. We are not people of short sight, unquote. Whilst I do not agree with his mode of managing our economy, I agree with the Minister for Finance when he says we should not go to the IMF. I told you already the IMF shocks economics back to life. It was not set up and has no success stories for making economies flourish and thrive. And we don't want to be merely a bedridden economy. I am also afraid that an IMF program will start with an audit of COVID-19 expenditures. And given what has happened with some other audits in other African countries, I shudder to think what will happen if we are audited for our use of the double-digit billions of Ghana cities the IFS gave us as COVID support. So the final portion of my paper, what should we do? Three steps for putting Ghana's economy on a firm footing for the future. In concrete terms, we need to implement the following steps in order to prevent a coup and the collapse of our economy. The first step is to pass the darn Farafucking E-Levy bill immediately and implement it effectively. Yes, you heard me right. The E-Levy is both Dan and a Farafaka. However, to prevent the collapse of the economy and a return to the stranglehold of the IFIs, we have no choice but to pass it. As someone has noted, President Nana Doadankwa Kufuado will go down in history as, quote, the president of public debt, or, quote, the president of austerity, or maybe both. E. Levy is the part of the presidency of austerity. The starting point for successfully passing the E. Levy bill is for government to stop lying to us, the citizenry. Come clean. Confess that you had thought the job of managing the economy was simple, but that you now know better. Abate the arrogance and high-handedness. Ask the people of Ghana for forgiveness. And pray the people of Ghana that we have limited options right now. We either allow the economy to collapse and we all suffer, and get back into the grips of the neo-colonial IFIs, or we use the e-levy to prevent economic recession and depression. Ghanaians are smart and empathetic, and will gladly support the e-levy if this is done right. Fellow Ghanaians, if we do not support the done for a fucking e-levy, government will simply tax something else such as fuel, they are already doing it, leading to a hike in trotro fares. And they will additionally steal for central government from the district assembly's common fund, the GET fund, the national health insurance levy, the road fund, they are already doing it. Just like Kwesi Boche discovered taxes on fuel during the Gulf War, Kendo Furiata discovered taxes on Momo during COVID. We have in Ghana over 40.5 million mobile phone subscribers 
and over 17.1 million active mobile money subscribers. The total value of transactions on mobile money grew by a cumulative average growth rate of 65% between 2016 and 2021. Significantly, it rose from just 78.5 billion Ghana cities in 2016 to almost 1 trillion cities in 2021. And so the e-levy, depending on the rate and the patronage, could rake in billions of cities every year. And the e-levy is easy to identify and cheap to collect. The bond markets say they won't give us money anymore or at, executive in, uh, at excessive interest rates. Domestic savings have been mopped up. What do you want the government to do? We can no longer borrow on the international financial markets except as horrendous interest rates because our current debt to GDP ratio of over 80% has led to investor fears of our ability to pay or sustain payments of loan interest or principal at some point. Further, Increased inflation in developed countries is expected to lead to an increase in financial costs in the international capital markets and consequently affect interest rates. It is no surprise that government has decided to suspend borrowing from the international capital markets. The Farafakin e-levy, as horrible and as wicked as it is, is the only way to save our economy from collapse in the near term. Fellow Ghanaians, the power is in your hands. Let us embrace the Farafakin e-levy and save our economy and our nation from collapse. This is the sad reason why I have become an ardent supporter of the Dan Farafakin e-levy. Because without it, the economy will collapse. As Ghanaians, we should, however, ask for one thing absolute transparency every step of the way in the way and manner the e-levy is collected and used. Occupy Ghana has called for this already. This is the place to establish a special e-levy commission, not in those other areas. History is beautiful and history matters. On 1st April 1852, the Gold Coast Poll Tax Ordinance was proclaimed. It failed and was finally scrapped by the colonialists in 1861. The problems were, one, misapplication of proceeds, two, embezzlement of tax proceeds, three, weak monitoring, four, poor patronage, five, lack of consultation, and fifth, failure of the British to protect the coastal states from the Ashantis, in this case, a possible failure to protect low-income workers. This is 1852 the same problems the e-levy is facing today. The e-levy commissioner and commission have their job well cut out for them if they are to make the e-levy succeed. It is sad that we have had to get here, but it will be sadder if we do not pay it in the short run and start holding government by the truth to account for every little peso we pay. Citizen groups must actively audit the e-levy account as a backup to the work of the e-levy commission. After we pay the Farafakin e-levy, we need to immediately begin the process of redeeming our economy and our nation. And now I'm moving to the second step of the three-step redemption style. That step is to exploit COVID-19 to shore up domestic production and import substitution saving the city from its endless run at Hussein Bolt speed against the major currencies and create the needed decent jobs to keep the youth busy so they don't join the coup. This process will include rationalization of the tax exemptions we offer in this country and reorder them to support domestic production. Our president in his 2019 State of the Nation address painted a dire picture of the tax exemptions regime, calling it, quote, a growing threat to fiscal stability and revenue generation, unquote. Again, 
Using rapid COVID-induced digitization of the economy, we can easily reduce the cost of doing business and general transaction costs, even the cost of goods and services generally. Using technological developments and innovations spawned and spared by COVID. Rough as it may sound, the second step may also involve auctioning our bauxite or other mineral reserves to the Chinese, for example, for many billions of dollars that will be used exclusively for rebuilding and extending our roads, railways, irrigation fields, power plants for export of power to the West Africa power pool and beyond, and so on. The production from these investments will then pay off our loans with change to lend to other countries. The third and last step is to constitutionalize our development. As a nation, we should be ashamed that my private firms plan for four to 10 years, whilst our entire nation has functional plans and budgets for only one year. The longest we plan for is four years as a country. And most of the times, we don't get there. Are we all right? This is why we need to constitutionalize our development, so that the broad strokes of our development are contained in the directive principles of state as enforceable provisions with a constitutional directive for an independent National Development Planning Commission to detail out from that a 40 to 50 year development plan. As I have just said, sorry, all I have just said are contained in the recommendations of the Constitution Review Commission set up by President Mills and in the 40 year development plan that President Mahama commissioned and completed, titled Black Star Rising, Long-Term National Development Plan for Ghana, 2018 to 2057. Kudos also in this last respect to Dr. Nimoy Thompson, one of Africa's veritable economists, and to Dr. Kwesi Boutre, who were Director General and Chair, respectively, of the National Development Planning Commission that spearheaded the 40-year development plan. Professor Fiajo, the chair of the Constitution Review Commission, under whom I worked as executive secretary to the commission, and the members of the commission, which included the new patriotic party stalwart, Akenten Apiaminka, also deserve mention. These same proposals are contained in the agenda for constitutional reform, spearheaded by Dr. Abu Sakare's national interest movement. As Vice President Mike Pence stated recently, if we lose faith in our constitution, we will lose our country. The constitutionalization of our development plan will make it compulsory for each successive government to implement the plan, taking off from where the predecessor government left off. Our constitution is largely a political document. It is necessary to amend it to meet our developmental needs and objectives, moving it from a political to a developmental constitution. A comprehensive, long-term, strategic, multi-year and binding national development plan covering the hard and soft aspects of governance and flexible enough for each administration to determine the methodologies for implementing the plan, but not the core objectives and targets of the plan is well overdue. Conclusion. We are living in a really fucked up world today. Again, excuse my French. A third world war is imminent over Ukraine, of all places. The COVID-19 pandemic is ravaging the world. Repressive regimes are now the majority the world over, most exploiting COVID to expand their powers and repress their citizenry. Canada, of all places, is clamping down on citizen demonstrations and the United States experienced their first attempted coup d'etat in centuries in January last year. As for Africa, literally every government is being toppled or sitting on tenterhooks. The picture does not look good. 
the world cannot continue like this. And Ghana, always the peace setter, must show the way. It can be done. Like I said many months ago, from this very platform, and paraphr paraphrasing Reverend Father Stephen Kofi Sakwaku, who gave the opening prayer that day, quote, may it not be said that we live by a stream of water and yet are thirsty. May it not be said that we live in a land of milk and honey and yet go hungry. This is the reason Solidar Ghana was formed. May she continue to use her joint intellectual resources to ensure that all Ghanaians drink from the streams of milk and eat of the honey that Odumankuma has given us and which Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah retained and maintained for us. And may our government always remember the final words of Adangba in his song, Animal Farm. Quote, jobless, no the mean senseless. Poverty, no the mean useless. One day, they go resist, unquote. I thank you for your attention, and may God bless our homeland Ghana and make our nation great and strong. Thank you.